Today, we take our cameras out to sea with Canon Explorer of Light, Anna Vanderwall, on Behind the Shot. Hi, and welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brownsell, your host, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. I've got a great show lined up for you today, but before we get into it, a couple of quick reminders. If you're watching this show on YouTube, make sure you look below. You'll find all the links necessary, and you can find the show notes at the website, which is BehindTheShot.tv. You can find me on social media at BehindTheShotTV, or you can find me at uh, SteveBrazzle.com or at Steve Brazzle on any social media, so make sure you find me there. And of course, if you ever want to reach out about anything, make sure that you do. I welcome comments down below. If you are watching on YouTube, one other thing I want to ask, make sure you go down and hit that subscribe button and hit the bell so that you are notified each and every time I release a new episode, or for that matter, we do one of the critique shows like I do with Don Komarechka at the beginning of every month. And that brings us to today's guest. So today's guest is going to be a special one because where this guest lives and what this guest photographs brings back such amazing memories of my youth. I want to welcome Anna Vanderwall. Anna, how are you? Thank you. Good. Thank you for having me on today. This is great. It, I, I'm so glad to have you because when when uh, our mutual friend Scott connected us and I found out that you lived in Newport, Rhode Island, I spent a good amount of my youth in Newport, Rhode Island. I still tell people, if you don't do anything else in New England ever, go do 10 mile drive. <laughs> Right? Yeah, you're so right. Biked it many times. Ooh, yeah. that would be neat. Oh, it's beautiful to bicycle along there. Yeah, it's great. Sea so for those that don't know 10 Mile Drive, it's it's a I don't even know how to describe it. It's it's a 10 mile road that has all the famous mansions from the Goodyears and the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilt one is the Breakers, there's Marble House. Um it, it's and and when I say mansions, I'm talking like European type chateau French. mansions yeah. made of marble exactly it's yeah. and don't forget it also includes that beautiful coastal drive uh you know when you're going along that road you're looking south and the next stop is bermuda so um not only do you see all the mansions but you see that beautiful coastal stretch so it's a wonderful drive you're right and and great walk we're going yeah. on a total tangent here which i love but yeah. they've got cliff walk where you can walk along the cliffs and it's cliffs right Right there on the ocean, and really, there's no big walls back there. You're no, looking nothing. at the backyards, which are acres and acres and acres of green, green grass for these amazing mansions. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just the such best. memories the, the for lawns. me. I absolutely love it. So let's talk about you. I mentioned you're a Canon Explorer of Light. Could you explain to me? I, I we were talking in the green room. I've had so many Canon Explorers of Light on, and and I'm friends with a number of Canon Explorers of Light. And one question I don't think I've ever asked them. When when you first found out, how long have you been one? Um, oh, it's about 13 years, 14 when, years, something like that. When you got the request, Anna, will you be a, a Canon Explorer of Light? What goes through somebody's head? Because that is, that is an elite thing. But I must tell you, more interestingly, how... I be, how they came to me and how they asked me, because every year I went to Photo Expo in New York at the Javits, and there was a gentleman there, this is years ago, this is 20 years ago that was running the program. And I'd go up to him and he was always very busy and he'd say, and he'd say to me, hey, Anna, nice to see you, very busy, can't talk now, see ya. And that was it for the year. And I did that for nine years. Every year I'd go up to him and say, hey, Dave, it's Anna Vanderwall. Yeah, I know who you are. Nice to see you. Sorry, very busy. Can't chat now. And that was it. Well, nine years later, after nine you know, attempts of trying to get in the door, um, he called me up one day and he said, hey, I need a shot that really shows rugged conditions. We wanted to use the, the war in Iraq, but it's too political. And I straight away thought, hmm, how about a nice sailing shot? And it suddenly just the lights went on and I thought, I've made contact with this guy. It's taken me nine years of pounding on his door, but here we are. So I sent him a shot and he just said, bingo, this is great. And they used it in, in, in one of the camera brochures. And, um, and I said, by the way, I want to get into the group. And he says, well, Stephen Gleamer is going to take over the program. Why don't you 
chat to Steve. And I did. And within six months, I was in. And to ask, answer your question, uh, the letter wasn't like, well, would you be interested in being an explorer? He said, we want you to be part of the program. You've been talking to Dave. And I was like, yes, I guess. Psyched, of course. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me in photography. You know, And, and, and I've said this a bunch of times. People think I'm doing Canon ads, and I'm not. I, I am a Canon shooter, but in truth, even I've at times you know, thought about, is there a right time to change? What are each company doing, right? Cameras uh, cameras are amazing in kind of my phone. I take on vacation now for a camera. So yeah. in fact, I'm using it right now as, as a webcam for those that are watching the video. That's my phone, right? I mean, it's amazing what you can do with, with different gear nowadays. Yeah. But yeah. one of the things I love about the Explorer of Light program is they don't, they don't stay traditional. Like in October of last year, they added Atiba Jefferson, who I've had on the show, wonderfully nice guy, was a photographer for the Los Angeles Lakers, but is super well known for being a skateboard photographer. Now, I can't think of another photography company out there that would have even considered a skateboard photographer in their elite program. But what he's doing is elite, unusual photography that's beautiful. And, and I, I love that about where this program goes. And again, I don't see a lot of nautical photography. You shoot nautical, a, a, a marine, maybe a good way to put it. You mentioned yeah. sailing, right? Yeah. I, I'm sometimes kind of curious. When, you know, sometimes people say marine, and then I don't want people to think that I'm underwater. So um, marine is more on the surface, boats, ships, sailboats, powerboats, all that stuff. So yeah, right. You're not you're not you're not snorkeling or or diving reefs and shooting stingrays, no. right? No, I'm not. But your background, you're Dutch, also South African in some ways, based on having lived there for a long time, and now you live in Newport, Rhode Island. Which, again, having been there for years and years, what you shoot. Okay, wonderful seaside town, but what you shoot specifically ties to Newport, Rhode Island, because Newport, Rhode Island was the longtime home of the America's Cup. Right. And I'm kind of curious with, with the Dutch heritage, the history from South Africa, and now the New England, quaint New England town, does that kind of international mix play a role in, I don't want to say what you shoot, but but how you shoot? I mean, in other words, do you see your international life experiences coming through in your photography? Well, I think to answer that, I have to say, I have to tell you how I came to Newport and how I got to start shooting because, you know, I grew up in South Africa and then left in 79 to go ocean racing as a professional and did a bunch of transatlantic races and all that good stuff. And then I wanted to leave South Africa to go sailing because there wasn't a whole ton of, you know, big boat racing. And I wanted to go to Europe and race there and in England and Holland and Germany. And that sort of, every time I heard people talk about Newport and, oh, there's the Newport Bermuda race and this kind of stuff. So here I'm racing as a professional and then started going through Newport a couple times as a as a racer as a sail sailboat crew and that sort of you know my international sailing experience brought me to Newport um, and then later on when i sort of decided to bail out of racing full time um, i settled in Newport but that's sort of i don't know well, if that answers your question but yeah it does well i i i guess i would still say though do you find that that life experience of traveling the world. You were on the Dutch maxi boat flyer too. You won all four legs of the, uh, the Whitbread round the world race in 81 right. and 82, I think is what I looked up. Correct. Uh, Bauman and engineer on that. So you, you kind of have something by the way in common with Peter Hurley too, who loves to sail. So That's again, another though, interesting story. We'll talk about him. Remember that. I'll tell you a wonderful story about Peter Hurley. Okay. I just had him on amazing <laughs> episode. It was absolutely amazing. By the way, people, if you haven't seen the Peter Hurley episode, seriously, it's one of my favorite episodes I've ever done. It was that good. The subject of his headshot joined us on the show. It was really, really ah, good. So, nice. but again, I want to go back to that question. And that was, does that, that world traveling, does that influence what comes into the camera? 
It must In other do. words, do you see the world differently, do you think, because of it? Oh, I think so. I think it's in a very broad, because I've traveled a lot. I've been to, I think, 78 countries uh, in all wow. my sailing and photography and sort of my nautical experience since I left South Africa when I was 23. You know, I, I can't say to you and pinpoint something, but it must influence how I shoot things and how I see things and how I relate to the whole boating scene. Because what I've seen from the South Pacific to Antarctica to parts of China to, you know, it, there's just right. such a nice broad, you know, feed coming on. Yeah. Well, and it's led you to, I'm going to call this first part kind of the education side of things, which again, I, to me, the the international flavor of your life, I think, is perfect from an educational point of view in the world that we live in today, right? So you did, for TEDx Newport, you were a TEDx speaker. You yeah. do workshops. And some of the workshops, I got to say, I'm not a sailor. I'd probably get motion sick. But <laughs> my gosh, I want to do the workshops on the water. Well, uh, we do them in flat water most of the time, so you'd probably be all right. <laughs> I'd probably be okay. Uh, yeah. You know, boning for the win. You know, you do one on one on the water, which would be really, really interesting. One on one with, with Anna, and then uh, you do one explore Greenland, which has got to be beautiful, if nothing else. It, so, this summer it'll be three summers ago that I went to Greenland the first time, shooting on a private ninety foot sailboat for uh, a boat owner, and spent two weeks on on the boat and going ashore and shooting. And I had a lot of freedom. I could just do my thing and just fell in love with the place with, with Western Greenland near Disco Bay. And when I got home, I said to my wife, that was an amazing experience. I love the high latitudes. So, you know, the Arctic and the Antarctic, and I've been to both. And I said to my wife, we need to do a workshop in Greenland and charter a boat and take whatever, six, seven, eight photographers and go and show them the Arctic and just go and shoot. And so I did some research and I found the boat and I found the Icelandic skipper and we went to Eastern Greenland and we took seven photographers and two spouses. So we had nine on board blown away. The people were just blown away by just the sheer, the beauty, the peace and the quiet and the shooting opportunities. So it's, right. it's very unique. Well, yeah. And, and again, not a landscape photographer. I struggle at it. Uh, definitely not a nautical photographer, but just the, just the thought of trying to do those in a place like Greenland would be talk about inspiration, right? I mean, I've heard Scott Kelby say a million times, if you want to take beautiful pictures, go to a beautiful place, right? Yeah. Stop stop going somewhere, taking a picture and going, why isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Go to beautiful places that would do it. So I have some questions for you before we bring up your photo. Because shooting what you shoot, and we talked about it's not underwater per se, which almost would make it easier to me, right? If you're underwater and you do a really good expensive underwater housing, okay, your gear is protected, yeah. And I'm sure you use housings we'll get into in a minute, even when you're on the deck of a boat. But the the conditions above water when you're at sea on a crazy sailboat like the shot that we're going to see with the splashes, the salt water and just even the salt air. We all know, you know, if you live in Newport Beach, California, your car is going to rust even though you're not driving it in the water. Right. It's <laughs> it's it's the salt air. Right. Cameras are tools. You use the tool. It's a mechanics wrench, right? You use it, but but being near salt water specifically, and even more importantly, sand. The only time I've ever scratched a phone is sand will scratch everything and it gets in everything. So explain to me the precautions that somebody like you takes to protect your gear. And I'm curious if you've ever had an accident where something didn't work. So the only precaution that I can take with my gear, and believe me, I... I don't get gear for nothing. I'm a Canon Explorer of light, but I pay for my gear. So I don't just throw, you know, you know, caution to the wind. So when I'm going to my location, when I'm flying, it's all nicely boxed up and I carry my gear on. And when I'm going down to the boat, I'm in a big SK, you know, case or Pelican box or whatever. But the moment I get on the boat and I start shooting, I open the case I grab my gear, I close the case. Let's say I grab a 500 or a 300 or whatever, 
and I start working. And that's really when I don't care anymore about the spray and the ocean and all that. Because if you start ducking and dodging and trying to, you know, be careful about your gear, then you're not going to get the shot. And so really what thing, you're doing is just minimizing the, you're, you're minimizing the, the amount of, uh, uh, you're, you're minimizing the window that damage could happen by minimizing right. how long it's out. Right. So, so I work with three or four bodies. They're always in a nice big box. I close the plastic box. There's three bodies in there. I got one in my hand and I'm working away. And really the only thing that drives me nuts is getting a bit of fine spray on the front element. So I've got an old diaper or I've got a little face cloth or something in a cotton and I just wipe that, that, you know, the front elements this size. I give it a good wipe and I keep going. And of course, if I'm following a sailboat and there's a little bit of wind, well, then I'm constantly wiping that front element and the camera gets very wet and it's 100% salt water. But I really, I, I, it sounds crass to say I don't care about the camera because I want to get the shot. And it's just, you know, it's worth it to me. It's a tool. But honestly, I, I can tell, I can count. I've been doing this for 35 years. I can count on one hand how many times I've trashed a camera. I've, I have an archive of three and a half million photographs. And I once fell off a boat because a piece of gear broke. Camera on in hand? Oh, yeah. Oh. In the, in the water, upside down, swimming, waving. Hello, please come and pick me up. Don't forget I'm here. Five minutes later, literally a full five minutes later, after two passes, they came by and picked me up. Well, of course, the camera was trashed. But really, that's the only extreme situation where I trashed a camera because I was w working on the water, and that wasn't from spray. And other than that, one other time, you know, eventually a camera got so wet that when I sent it into CPS at Canon, you know, the the... The technician, who, who is Japanese, whose English wasn't very good, said to, said to me in the note, the repair note, please store camera in dry location, <laughs> you know. And I was like, well, that's not what I do, you know. Yeah. But it's – people ask me this a lot. They said, so how do you protect your gear? I don't. You don't even and use I'm a housing? I'm standing here with a Canon billboard in my hand, but the tough – the stuff is so tough. They, you don't, they, you don't put your gear, like, like the shot we're going to bring up here in just a second, people, I promise I'm going to get to the shot. You don't put your camera in a housing? No. I'm on deck of a motorboat and sometimes it's a small boat. I have a 25 foot rubber inflatable boat. It does this, it does this, and there's fair amount of spray that's coming over. Um, but most of the time it's pretty dry. No, the camera is butt naked. The lens is there. And like I said, the only thing that I'm worried about is the front element, because if that gets salty, then it looks like a soup sandwich, you know? Right, right. So, um, but if the spray gets on the outside of the lens or on, on the camera itself, it doesn't matter. It's okay. not going in there. Let me, let me ask this. If, if you did get salt water on the outside element, again, there's salt in there. You don't just wipe it off. You rinse it off with clean water first. It depends. If I'm out in the water and I'm shooting and the spray comes on, I just wipe it. I don't worry about if it's been there for a day, then that salt has dried and it's salt crystals. And in the worst case, I lick it to get it wet and to get, get the salt crystals off because then you will scratch the coating. Well, and that's the question is, have you ever seen a, a scratch like that from that? Years and I guess more ago, importantly, if you did, did it affect your picture? No, but it was it was. It was not, it was in my Olympus days when I was shooting with Olympus on an OM-1. And one, I wiped so much that eventually I, I wiped the coating off. Then I kept oh. shooting. But with the Canon stuff, I've never seen the coating come off. And I've honestly, yeah, you see minute little marks, but I think it's more from throwing them in the box and grabbing another one right. that they get yeah. banged around. Yeah, okay. But um, the, so then to answer your question about wiping it down, yes, when I get to the hotel or I'm on the boat that night, I get a little face cloth, I wet it, wring it out, not too much, that it's nice and wet, and wipe the whole camera down, that it really absorbs. And then the camera's quite wet, but it's fresh. Then I grab a dry face cloth or a nice soft cotton towel and really dry the whole thing off. That and that's sense. what it gets once a day. And then that camera goes once a year, unless I really toast the thing that I feel it needs more, but... The, the camera body goes once a year to CPS, 
and I just say, clean it, service it, replace what needs to be done, then I get it back like a new camera. Same with the lenses. That's, Maybe, that's not um, dissimilar uh, to me. When I shoot an outside festival, which of course concerts are you know, in the before times when concerts existed, right. uh, I would shoot an outdoor festival with a ton of dust. There would be dirt and dust on everything. I'd blow what I could, but once a year, I take my cameras to CPS, still to me the gold standard for service actually. And sure. I would take my cameras to CPS and just have them do whatever is needed. And just, it, it, I, always, uh, I always make the analogy that I've known so many mechanics in my life. Mechanics don't use their tools, get them greasy and put them in a toolbox. You'll watch a real mechanic because it's the tools of his job and he needs it tomorrow. You will watch them at the end of a shift, wipe the sockets down to where they're like new before they put them away because that's the tools right. of my job. As long as you take right. care of it, y your, your images to me, when I look through your website, which is popping up on the lower thirds, people, if if you want to see it, or links are at BehindTheShot.tv or in the show notes here on YouTube as well, your images have a power and a grandness to them. I don't even know how to describe it other than power and grandness, which is part, part of the ocean with the man-made, with the men that are on the... What's the one element that you hope to have in any given shot? that conveys that power, if there is one, I guess. Yeah, there. it depends. You know, if there's one element I'm trying to convey, obviously it's beauty of the shot. It's got to be a compelling image. But that image can be an advertising shot for a boat builder, which I do a lot of commercial boat building advertising photography, um, which, you know, you've got to pull the reader in. He's looking through a magazine. It's a one page ad and all is at the bottom. It just says the website of the builder and right. the picture. Somebody has got to catch you. If I'm out there and I'm shooting an, a beautiful cruising boat and there's very, very little wind, I've got to be super creative and work with the reflections on the water and the late lights just an hour before sunset. You've got to work and get something, even though the boat is barely moving along, it's drifting along. You got to make that shot that people say, whoa, that's really cool. He captured the spirit of that boat with almost no wind at all versus a sailboat shot when it's blowing 25. And I mean, it's like, you know, you're holding on for dear life because the boat's doing this. And then you're just looking for that total, the boat, the bow goes down, the spray comes out, the guys are braced holding onto the boat. You're looking for that powerful shot, you know? Yeah, okay. And if, yeah, it's, um, I, I always say my, my work, I need breeze. I need sunshine. And if I can get a swell, that's the bonus. So those three items together, then I can work some magic. All right. I like that. So for everybody, BehindTheShot.tv is where you can find the show notes for this. You'll find a, a little bit that I wrote about Anna. You'll find some of the images, including some of those that he, have done, that he has done for boat companies, uh, are in the gallery there. And all the links are also, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll find the links down there as well. If you're on YouTube, again, go down, click the subscribe button. Click the bell, smash the bell. You can subscribe. If you don't click the bell, you're not going to find out when I release everything that's new. So make sure that you do that as well. So with that in mind, I want to bring up this shot because this, my friend, this is power. This is that grandness that, that I'm talking about. So let's describe this a little bit here. First of all, is there a shot name for this? Do you name your shots? I will if it becomes a gallery shot, and then my wife will give it, a, you know, a gallery number. But there's always a certain name, whereas this is not in our gallery collection. Um, but this particular shot has done well because it really illustrates, um, you know, color and precise moment and all that stuff. But I don't have a name for it, no. Okay. So the an boat number is 088. So we'll call yep. it, you know, shot 088. Yep. But there's a number of things I love about this. And for those of you that are on the audio feed, I'm going to try and describe it to you. First of all, it is a sail racing boat. The shot angle is what I find interesting and powerful here. So Anna is not up high on another boat shooting down at this. He's not even low in a dinghy shooting up at this. He's about mid hull. 
And what that does, it's almost like eye level to a model, right? So you're getting the sense of size and motion of this boat. You, in fact, barely above the water line or above the splash line, right? If, if above it at all, the boat is coming in from the left side of the frame to the right side of the frame, but it's coming in in a way that I feel like, like I can't tell the lens you use here. I happen to know it from the EXIF data, but it's almost like you are right in front of them and they're about to clip you. It's, it, it's coming right toward the camera and hooking camera right just to get out a little bit. The boat is also leaning heavily to the right in small caps and waves. The entire crew, like six people, hanging off the side of the boat. They're sitting on the edge of the boat, hanging off the side as though they are trying to balance it uh, in, in the water so that it doesn't go over. They're leaning, literally leaning overboard. And... They're literally, when I say they're sitting on the edge of the boat, it's almost like they're all sitting in the exact same spot, right? They are on top of each other to get exactly what they want out of their position in relation to the boat's movement. The boat number is clear. The boat name is clear. The crew is clear. Everything is tack sharp. And yet, the beautiful background of other boats and sails is beautifully soft. <laughs> it's, there's just, it, I, I don't even know how to describe the fact that the depth of field here is such that everything I care or need to see is tack and everything else falls off. Like it's just, you, but you can see what it is, right? It's just, it just fades away into the, the distance. But here's where I think this shot elevates. The colors in this image, and I don't mean the colors that the boat designer picked or that the, the numbers are red. I mean the representation photographically of these colors. It's vibrant, it's saturated, but not like it was done in post. It's like my eyes are seeing it realistically in, in like I'm standing on the deck, I'm in outside light, and that outside light is perfect for me to see. Realistic pop from the colors. That's what I get from this shot. Did I miss anything? How'd I do? You did well. I liked your description. I like your non-sailing terminology, which is great. It's always nice to hear somebody that doesn't sail describe what's going on with the crew and the boat and all that kind of stuff. Good job. It's nice. So what would you, what do you call it when they sit on the edge like this? Well, they're hiking. So they're hiking hard and the whole idea to have, I think there's probably seven people sitting on the rail and there's one guy steering, you cannot see him, but he's sitting on also on the rail on the high side and he's behind that whole group of people, but they want to keep their weight as tight together as they can in the middle of the boat, not too far forward, not too far aft, because then you start getting pitching. So that's why they jam together and you can see the girl in the front She's got her hand out and some of the other guys. And a lot of times when they're coming up to the mark, they will all stick their hands out and their torsos and their bodies and do this and get more weight over the side. Because what that happens then is the boat wants to come upright more. There's more sail area exposed to the breeze and the boat's stiffer and it just wants to go faster. So the, hiker, okay. the harder you hike the faster you go. So if I explain this in the way of like Peter Hurley says, is very, very good in a laser. He is in a world-class sailor of laser. That's where I met him. I was shooting him as a model when he was still modeling before he was shooting. Really? Peter Hurley. Yeah. He was the stud on my, I was shooting for laser. They, they, they build the sunfish sailboat and the laser sailboat. And this, this guy at the time, I don't know how old Peter was at the time, maybe 28, 29, 30, maybe, maybe 35, the studly looking guy. And I photographed him and he was wonderful to work with. But I'm getting a little bit away from my, my explanation here. So if you think of a guy sailing on a sunfish, if it's really blowing hard, he's got to get his butt over the side to keep that boat upright. The moment he slides inboard or comes in, gets his butt off the rail, that boat's going to go over. Okay. So if you keep your butt out there 
you're going to keep the boat flat. You're going to go really fast. Exactly the same happens to this shot of our Malgus number 88. They've got as much weight as they can on the rail, hiking hard, going as fast as they can. This was a world championships. So, you know, these, these are top class, you know, world class sailors. And this. you shot this according to the EXIF data with a, a 1DX, an EOS 1DX, F4, uh, a 500 F4 IS2, uh, but uh, EF 500. So how far away are you here? Well, I am not that far away. And there are two ways to get this shot. Either you go into the middle of the race course and if I have a really good driver who I can trust, and there are not that many of them, um, my name is on my boat. If I'm in the wrong place, everybody knows that Anna was in the middle of the race course and he was in the way. That's a big no-no. So, and it's, it's kind of cool because the guy that is the best driver for me is my son. He's 21. He has been driving for me since he was nine, standing on a peach crate to look over the windshield with his mother holding on to him that he wouldn't fall over the side. Now he is winning races in the laser and in the sunfish um, at a good level. And he drives for me. So when he is with me, we can go into the middle of the race course and the boats come all over. They come in front of us. They come behind us. They come next to us. He is my eyes behind me to my left and to my right. All I'm looking for is my composition. And I'm just looking for my boats. And I'll say to him, let's go a little left. There's two boats coming. Quick, 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 slow down. And then I bang, bang, bang. And he's watching that we don't get T-boned from the back right. by a, a guy like this coming up. Or you go to the mark. So the turning mark is where I am. I'm very close to the turning mark when I took this photograph. So you can sit right next to the. So here's the mark. The boats are coming up like this. They come around the mark and they go downwind again. And I can sit right in this area. And if there's long as there's not a committee boat or some judge or some official who's trying to be a total royal pain in the you know what, um, I can sit there very happily. And then my son or my driver has to hold station. And that boat, my boat, wants to drift down into the race course. So it's very important that you have a driver that understands sailing, who is a racer himself, but even more importantly, can handle a small power boat with a single propeller and keep it on station. Because you have current, you have wind, you have waves, and you have other photo boats there as well. You don't want to be third row and have four photo, photo boats in front of you, you're not going right. to shoot squat. So it's a matter of being in the right place, being courteous and polite, and everybody's sitting and juggling in their position, and I can just keep working my shot. And a lot of people who, who don't understand working on the water say, well, you use a tripod or you use a monopod. It doesn't work, obviously, because my boat is doing this constantly. You know, So you're hand-holding a 500, a 600, an 800. And you've got to be fairly fit and fairly strong because it's fine to do it for half an hour. But if you're shooting for five days, every day you're on the water from 10 till 4, believe me, the, f the fifth day or on Friday afternoon, your shoulders are just so sore from hand holding a 500 or a 600. And I'm not talking, I'm talking a big F4, right. you know, lens. These are heavy pieces of glass, like what the, the, the football guys are using. You know, that's what we're using on the water, but we're hand holding those things. I held, so, I, I, from Canon on the loaner program for CPS, yeah. I got a 402.8 and used it three nights in a row for three different concerts that were soundboard shoots. And I tried using a monopod, but I couldn't get the angles that I wanted quick enough. So yeah. finally I just took the monopod off, clipped it on my belt, folded it up, clipped it on my belt. And I held, handheld that thing, a 2.8, 402.8 for three nights in a row. And I yeah. will say, by the end of that, my elbow was killing me. This yeah. this kind of, to me, answers, I think, your exposure here. So according to the EXIF data, you shoot or shot this, at least, in aperture priority. And the Correct. exposure was a two thousandth of a second, yep. ISO 200, F5.6. Yep. What that tells me is this is super, super bright. Yeah. 
Is two thousandth of a second in this particular instance, is that simply because of the brightness based on the depth of field you wanted in the ISO you got? Or is that a normal exposure here, normal shutter speed to freeze what is happening here? Yeah, so I would say when I'm shooting in this environment, obviously being at 5.6 with a 500 millimeter lens, there's not a lot of depth of field. So you can see the next boat downwind or coming up to the mark is yeah. soft, which is nice. I like that. I would say 5.6, I will not go any shallower than that because what starts to happen is I'll get the 88 number sharp, but then the crew is not. Or I'll get the gal on the bow sharp and the rest of the crew fall away. They're out of focus. There are times when it's nice to do that. But I would say I would probably shoot more at F8 or, or not so much at 5.6. I would say if you showed me this particular picture and I didn't remember what my settings were, I would have said to you, I probably shot that as, this at F8 with an ISO of 200 and I was probably at a shutter speed of about 1,000 or 1,200 or 1,500. And well, and I, I can imagine that's... on this, actually, if this boat was at a different angle, a 500 at 5.6, you would have had a depth of field problem. It's yeah. the fact that it's the fact that it's turning frame right. Correct. So that I'm seeing the side of the boat, not the tip of the boat. If that boat was yeah. coming straight at me, yeah. those people would fall out of focus. But you're writing, uh, according to, again, EXIF data, you're writing the exposure bias. You're plus right. uh, two thirds of a stop here, plus 0.667, which... It's interesting to me that you're you're boosting exposure. Is it the, is the camera in in aperture priority mode? It the is. camera is reading this as bright because it is darkening yeah. it too much. But then at that point, based on where they are in the light, you're willing to blow something out to bring that exposure up where you need it. Is that what you're doing? So I and. As everybody who shoots RAW knows, it's much easier to work with a, a bright RAW file or even to the point of almost being overexposed than having something dark. So if I'm even slightly doubting what's going on, I will go plus a third or plus two thirds and just watch my histogram. But, you know, if the bow and I use my little blinkies on my camera. Are, are you willing to clip something? I mean, like if some yeah. of the white boat here, because yeah. this boat is white, 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 yeah. white, white. Yeah. If some of that boat clipped, you probably actually may not even notice it. Would that be you okay to you? wouldn't notice it. And if you get just a small part of that white bow that's clipping, or maybe just where, where the, the white water under the, that's also very white where that white water. Yeah, exactly. That where, the, where, where you can see where the water's going towards the keel. That's very bright. That's bordering on being blown out. But look at the faces and look at the sails, the sail, the, those dark sails. So you're dealing with some fairly extreme exposure conditions with a very dark sails, a very white hull. And I am a lot of times I am at a plus a third or plus two thirds and constantly watching, watching my histogram. Obviously, if it's a black boat, coming at me, then I've got a problem and I won't do that. But um, most of these boats are white. So you're sort of fairly safe going a little bit over. And it's the okay. middle of the day. It's very contrasty. So, so uh, again, EXIF data, this was shot out of white balance, which I shoot raw. I have no problem changing my white balance in post and setting Correct. it for an entire set of images should need be. Since you're shooting out of white balance, when you do bring this up in post, and I'll get into more post in a second here, but when you do bring this up in post... Are you clicking an eyedropper on something in here you know to be neutral gray or white like the boat? How are you setting your white balance in post? I The only time I use the eyedropper is if I'm shooting the interior of a boat and the designer is there and the fabric person is there and I've got to get it absolutely perfect. Then I will use the picker. I very rarely use a picker here because... I may use it just to, if I'm way off, if it's really yellow or really blue, then I may just use the picker to bring me back to some form of reality. And from there, I'll give it a little tweak. Okay. And I go by what I remember the day to be like. And secondly, 
does it look nice if you make it really cool or almost cold that the boat is like a screaming white? Then I find it's too cold and I give it just a little bit of warmth, a little bit to the right, you know, just so it's, it's my, it's my gut. It's my feeling what I want to do well, here you with know what, my color balance. Again, not a sailor, but I feel like I'm on the water with this thing. It's, and, and part of it to me is the crop. So you had sent me an image that was uncropped and you sent me this cropped version as well. This is the one that's on your website too, this, this cropped version that we're using in the show. And I find it interesting from a compositional point of view. So I should have mentioned this during the description from a compositional point of view, the water line, which again is above the bottom of the boat technically, the water line is almost at the lower rule of third. The top head of the, the crew member is the top rule of third. The people that are hiking, they're the left rule of third. And then the mast is the right rule of third. This thing lays out absolutely perfectly, not only on a rule of third, but you can also put a golden spiral on this and it works there as well. So when I looked at the uncropped version, it was fascinating to me when you cropped it, this almost, you know, if I bring this thing up full screen, this is almost 16.9. It's a little wider than 16.9. It doesn't fill the top and bottom of the frame here. Your choice of what to leave out and what to leave in was, was, perfect. You didn't cut people in the middle on the boat in the back, <laughs> uh, which people do, right? You'll see half right. a person back there because they figure, oh, right. it's blurry, you know, nobody. No, but you didn't cut a half a person. You didn't leave, you didn't leave a part of a boat or a sail in the background that had a shape on it that would be a distraction, right? There was, because I, as I recall, there was something yellow somewhere, I think over on the right side of the frame, in the uncropped version. And, and, and that would have been a distraction based on all right. the reds and blues on this boat. Right. So when you're, you know, from a portrait point of view, the rule of thumb is you don't cut people at joints. From a music point of view, what I shoot, we do the same thing, don't cut people at joints, but we, we treat instruments as appendages of the body. Don't cut a guitar head off right where the guitar head starts and better yet keep it because that's a part of their body type thing. When you're, there's so many moving parts happening here. When you're looking at your composition through the lens or in post for crop, what is it that you're thinking about? I can cut that, I can't cut there. So I shoot, sometimes, you know, if I put my focal point, let's say on the crew, or wherever I happen to put it now with it, the EOS, the, the R5, it's so easy to move the focal point, whereas with the 1DX, it wasn't so easy. Um, and I think to myself, oh, in post, I know exactly how I'm going to crop this. And it may be three or four days later that I'm sitting there doing my raw files and cropping the shot, and it just comes back to me like that. I know exactly how I'm going to crop it. And I always you, find you wait that- me. I have to interrupt you. I apologize. You completely pre-visualize the finished crop right. through the camera? Yeah. And even Love. though I, I may, I, 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 I'll be shooting with a 500 and I think I can really use an 800 here, but I have the 500. I know it's tack sharp. I've got a huge file. I can crop that thing in. No problem. No need to grab the 800. And then later on, when I'm on the computer in my office on my Mac, then I come back in and I, and I sort of crop in a little bit and I get back to where I was. But I, I do a lot of that where I think to myself, okay, in post, this is going to be very strongly panoramic or it's going to be very strongly vertical or whatever. And, um, yeah, it's just an advantage of having a really big sensor with a lot of data that you can play with these things. But I, I compose a lot like that when I'm shooting and try not to waste too much time. This is being shot in the heat of the moment. You can't really say to the boat driver, oh, go a little further away or come a little closer in or whatever. I just like bang, bang, bang. I know I can work with this later on. So you get this on your Mac. You're doing your post work. In your normal post work, what do you use? Are you a Lightroom user, Photoshop user, what? So my, my, my workflow is I use Photo Mechanic, you know, by Camera Bits. And yep, that's my I browser. Love it. I, it's sitting in front of me. It's, it's magic. So I download everything, obviously, onto my hard drive. And I use that 
software program. I renumber everything as raw files. And then I go through my raw files and pick my selects. And these are called to convert. And let's say out of 100, I pick 25. And those are my to convert. And then I go into Lightroom and point it at that folder and I start working. And, you know, I have a dedicated keyboard just for my Lightroom sh shortcuts. You know, there's no more fiddling around on, on, on the computer. I do everything on this keyboard and I have a ball mouse and that's how I do my raw conversion. And yeah, it's a laborious task and it takes a lot of time. But when I teach, I say to people, you should shoot raw because you can then make a perfect or make a really good capture and then you take it into the raw converter and you make it perfect and you are the artist because then you can just tweak that little blue and straighten the boat out sharpen it up a little bit and just really you know i i find it so creative to be able to have some nice music playing i'm on my imac and i'm able to take a really good raw capture, which I feel I did right. Everything is, is tack sharp. The shutter speed is correct. The exposure is correct. And then I do my final subtle little touches. I never do a lot. I mean, uh, you will never see my pictures that you say, oh my God, it's oversaturated. Oh, he's right. punched. You know, the, the shadow is too much. And it looks totally natural. And it's well, and, wonderful. And that's I the thing with this image again. To me, what makes this image, I mean, let's be honest, it's kind of everything that comes together to make the image. But what makes the image is, uh, Moose Peterson said to me once when I said to him, you know, I feel like I'm standing in this wilderness with you. And he said, that's the greatest compliment that you can give a landscape photographer. <laughs> and I'd argue it's the greatest compliment you can give any photographer that from a, even if it's not photojournalism, if you create a sense in my brain that I witnessed this live, even though I didn't, I think there's a success there. And that's yeah. what this shot does to me. I feel like I've been on the ocean and watch this. So you don't do a lot. What would you have done to this? I probably would have, because I'm on a rock and roll little power boat, you know, I would say 95% of my pictures, I've got to straighten my water level a little bit because sometimes the, you know, the water's running through the frame at this angle the ocean, the, the, the horizon line of the water. So I'll, I'll start off by straightening that out and then I'll give it a little bit of black just to take the soupiness out of it and, um, and color correction, you know, my color balance. I'll sort of, you know, if you go and order white balance, not every single shot has exactly the same color balance. Right. So I'll just make sure that the whites are nice and crisp and not sort of yellow, sharpen it up a little bit. Um, all very, very subtle little things. But since I've been shooting digital, you see how good the cameras have become, how now today the raw file needs very, very little to get it from its raw state into a JPEG. Uh, whereas, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, however long we've been doing this with digital, you had to do a lot of work to get And, and I could imagine looking. in a shot like this, you know, instead of clarity that everybody overuses, it has a purpose, but you know, it's a mid range contrast basically, but the new texture with an adjustment brush localized on things like the splash or something, or even a dehaze, I imagine could also do wonders to this type of a shot. So this shot was done. Um, you know, I think I probably shot this goodness six years ago. If I took a wild guess at the date, seven, six, seven years ago. So those didn't exist then? No, they didn't. And I'm not a big one to take stuff out and put stuff in and, and, and sort of, I just, I pride myself on going out there, banging the shot, putting it in the raw converter and within 30 seconds of, or for a minute of a couple of quick little tweaks and a preset, kick it out as a JPEG, bingo. And it's, and it's nice. I, there's people that will spend three, four hours tweaking a shot. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. It looks beautiful. I don't like doing that. I like to get it out there on the water and just nail it and get it perfect. And I think people always say to me, how do you, I always see your color and your sharpness and all that is always so nice. How do you do that? I said, well, my number, and I'm again, not, I'm not a salesman here, but 
you know, you got to have the right gear. If yeah. you can have these beautiful, crisp white lenses, it's the, that's half the battle right there because it's sharp. The color is nice, a big sensor, and, you know, the rest is history. But that's so, sort of. So I have a question for you. And I ask this of every guest, and it's a surprise intentionally because I'm, I'm curious of, of, of where you go with it. Is there a photographer? And if there isn't one, that's fine. Is there a photographer that Anna believes people should really know about and follow? And some people may already know about him and follow, and some people may not. But in your opinion, you know, if you don't know this person, go look them up, check them out. And if you like them, follow them on Instagram or something. Who's a photographer that you would recommend people go check out? So if you are like me and I would say a bunch of my followers, they they enjoy sailing and boating and the whole nautical world. And I find there is one, if we're talking about today, somebody that's still alive, there's an Italian photographer by the name of Carlo Borlenghi. And he is absolutely at the top. He is so good, this guy. I've worked with him many a time, working in a heli, on a chase boat, on a beach, having a beer. Um, he is the best. Nobody gets close to this guy. He's very involved with the America's Cup in New Zealand. He's shooting for the, the Italian team right now. He's stayed at my house. I've worked with him. He is it. And then if you go back to the turn of the century, there was a family, there was a there was a grandfather, a father, and a son called Rosenfeld. And these guys, the old man, the grandfather started shooting with an 8 by 10 plate camera on the water. And how would he fire this thing? He had the bulb in his mouth. So that's how he would fire the camera. And he had a plate camera, and he had probably 10 plates with him. And if you go and look up Rosenfeld, and now their, their collection is owned by Mystic Seaport in Connecticut. They have the most beautiful, these very old boats, beautiful wooden boats with acres of canvas, you know. So those are my two, Rosenfeld and Carlo Borlenghi from Italy. Those are, those are my heroes, those people. Okay. So I will put those links. I'll look them up and I'll email them to you to make sure I get the right people because I've made that mistake before. Okay. Uh, and I'll put those links in the show notes, everybody, at behindtheshot.tv. Anna, if people want to reach you, and, and if you're watching on the video on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, it's available video there too. Uh, lower thirds are coming up under Anna as we're talking, showing his website and his social media stuff. But for those of you on the audio feed, if you want to go follow Anna, and I highly recommend that you do because his, his photography will kind of change. The, no matter what you shoot, the way he, the way he captures a scene... I believe will change the way you shoot whatever you shoot. So your normal website is what? Vanderwall.com. So V-A-N-D-E-R-W-A-L.com. So that's okay. that's the website. And that has the gallery with the uh, the merchant site. And then it has my power boats and my sailing and my commercial work and some videos as well. And then I'm very active on Instagram. And my uh, I'm there. I'm on a Vanderwall. One, you know, obviously O N N E V A N D E R W A L, and we're very active on Instagram, and we posting stuff constantly on story and just images and Facebook as well. So and um, it's by the way, it's on a Vanderwall on all three major social media: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, right. I follow you on Instagram, uh, but go follow him everywhere. And then the TEDx talk was interesting. So if you want to see the TEDx Newport talk that he did, uh, just just Google Anna Vanderwall. Again, it's O-N-N-E, uh, TEDx, and you'll find it. It's available still on YouTube. Go check it out. That's a, that's a fun one as well. Anna, thank you so much for doing this. I cannot say how much I appreciate meeting you and how much I, I really appreciate your work. Well, it's been great. And I think your questions have been, I do a fair amount of talking and interviews and that, but it's so nice to be interviewed by a really knowledgeable photographer. And your questions were on the money and just made it interesting for me to uh, have a little banter with you and go to and fro. And I, I appreciate that you like my work. This is great. It's fun. You know, I'm not a wedding photographer. I'm not landscape. I do bang crash out in the ocean. So fun to chat with you about it. So thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. And the fact that I asked the right questions, you, you seriously, 
You have no idea what that means to me. To everybody else, make sure that you go to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. I've got a little bit that I wrote there about Anna at the website. There's a small gallery of his work, but more importantly, I have links where you can really go see all of his work. All his social media accounts, the TEDx talk link is there. His website link is there. Again, it's behindtheshot.tv. If you're watching this on YouTube, of course, all the links are down below on YouTube as well. If you want to find me, it's stevebrazel.com. It's like the country Brazil, but there's two L's or behindtheshot.tv. On social media, really, really easy. It's at Steve Brazel for my personal one, Behind the Shot TV for the podcast type stuff. And again, last thing, I just got to remind you one more time, if you are watching on YouTube, head down, click the subscribe button, click the bell. And wherever you get this podcast, really, ratings and reviews are very, very much appreciated. They help with discoverability and a bunch of other things. So please, if you would, whether it be Apple Podcasts or wherever you get it, drop a star rating, drop a review. It's much, much appreciated. To Anna, uh, thank you so much. Anna Vanderwall, uh, wonderful guest, Canon Explorer of Light. Go look him up. I'm Steve Brosel, your host. This is Behind the Shot, where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all the stories and challenges that happen in between. And we will see you on the next show. Thank you.